The Age of Enlightenment The Fifth Astral Era was an age of untold wonders, when the arcane arts burgeoned and the great civilizations that commanded such powers flourished. Alas, this Age of Enlightenment would not last. The War of the Magi brought the great floods of the Sixth Umbral Calamity, which swallowed once proud nations and left naught but a battered wasteland in its wake. Neneko Neko, Uldan Scholar The Fifth Astral Era Seeds of Magic At the dawn of the Fifth Astral Era, as Eorzea was huddling in the bitter cold of the endless frost, the people of the realm once more beseeched the Twelve for warmth. It was during this time that a magnificent cathedral was built on the edge of the Black Shroud, a sanctuary where people would fervently pray to the gods and harness the power of their blessings through the use of magic. These rituals rose in prominence as a way for the survivors of the Fifth Calamity to cope with the era's bleak prospects, and served as a driving force in the realm's revitalization. As the harsh climes subsided, the people once again set out across the realm. Small settlements grew into towns, then cities, each with their own unique culture. The universal worship of the Twelve splintered as the denizens of these communities sought to assert their newfound sense of identity by choosing patron deities to protect them. These widening differences in culture, religion, and approaches to the arcane arts would lead to intense contests for supremacy between nations. The first Sanctum of the Twelve is believed to have been erected around the dawn of the Fifth Astral Era. After years of disuse, the original structure fell into ruin, overgrown by the thick brush of the Black Shroud, and lying forgotten until after the Seventh Umbral Calamity, when it was unearthed and restored to its former glory. In the modern age, it also serves as a hall wherein the gods bear witness to the declaration of eternal bonds between lovers. A Precursor to War Fledgling cities emerged around the 300th year of the Fifth Astral Era, and for the next two and a half centuries, the number of city-states would grow to twelve, each paying tribute to a unique god or goddess of the Eorzean pantheon. These city-states, however, lacked the stability of their modern-day counterparts, and the onset of the Age of Enlightenment was rife with turmoil, with territorial borders endlessly redrawn as smaller domains found themselves ravaged, divided, or integrated into larger populations. By the thousandth year of the Fifth Astral Era, the realm's sovereign nations numbered six, the most prominent among them, Mark, located in the western basin of Yefem, Amdapur, situated on the plains of central Aldenard, or what is now the South Shroud, and Nim, spanning the western coast of the Isle of Vilbrand. In the latter half of the era, the city-states which had heretofore weathered centuries of intermittent upheaval would find themselves embroiled in a feud of an entirely different scale. The Dark City of Mark the lands of Yefem are presently mired in an uninhabitable saltwater swamp. Yet, this was not always the case. When the icy winds of the fifth umbral calamity abated, thawed snows trickled down from the northeastern mountains of Abalathia to form the White Maiden, which, in time, nurtured the soils of the lowlands. The region transformed into a fertile landscape, and it was near the 500th year of the Fifth Astral Era that the region's people came together to establish the city of Mark. At the time of its foundation, Mark was merely one among twelve undistinguished city-states struggling to survive. The Amdapori were the dominant power, controlling a sizable portion of central Eorzea and wielding significant influence outside their immediate domain. The balance shifted drastically in Mark's favor around the year 800, however, when a sorceress by the name Shatoto came upon a ruinous form of magic. A tale passed down by practitioners of the art in the Order of Naldthal claims it was Shatoto who first developed the ability to draw upon ambient ether to imbue her spells with deadly power. Thus, 
did the realm witness the birth of modern black magic. The Maquis used this newfound knowledge to bolster the strength of their army, and were successfully able to weather the tumultuous ebb and flow of feuds that reduced many other city-states to rubble, ultimately rising to become a substantial military power. The crumbled foundations of the city of Mark can still be seen in Yefem's brackish swamps. The enormous scale of these ruins evidence to the civilization's once vast population. Rising waters, however, have since reclaimed the former home of the mages, reducing it to an uninhabitable wilderness. Void Magics Although the Maki were known masters of black magic, the extent of their power was not limited to Shatoto's school of spellcraft. Toward the autumn years of the Fifth Astral Era, the civilization had begun perfecting void magics, the summoning and manipulation of creatures known as void scent from beyond the corporeal realm. A report by the scholars of the nominated observers of Artifacts Historical defines the void as an other world parallel to the one in which man dwells. Abnormal events can weaken the veil between worlds, tearing it asunder and allowing the void scent to invade the material realm. These fiends have a depraved appetite and seek our world merely to consume the ether it contains, allowing neither beast nor man to stand in their way. The mages of the Allegan Empire had previously experimented in forging covenants with the demons of the void in hopes of harnessing the creature's powers. The Maki expanded on this endeavor, adding extra protections to their experiments so as not to invite the same fate that befell the Allegans. To this end, the mages developed an occult device, the Null Stone, to preserve themselves and their city, should a pact be broken. If a summoned void sent refused to obey the master, a void mage could smite the feral being using the Null Stone to sever its ties to the corporeal realm. It was in mastering this power that Maki came to believe in their civilization's supremacy over all others, eventually driving them to war. Powerful void scent were brought to heal via the Nullstone, reducing them to not more than strategic weapons for the Maki military. A mage by the name of Colophisteri combined the power of an ether infused crystal with the ritual consumption of void scent blood to achieve a twisted form of immortality, that she might guard this artifact from those who might seek to destroy it. Creatures categorized in the upper rungs of the twelve-tiered void scent hierarchy cannot pass through dimensional borders by way of an artificial tear. They instead require a willing vessel from the corporeal side, possessing their soul and entering the world by way of a summoning. The Null Stone has the capability to destroy that vessel and nullify the pact between it and the summoner making it a powerful tool in maintaining control over even the most powerful of void scent. The Ancient City of Amdapur At the dawn of the Fifth Astral Era, a group of Hur arrived in what is now the South Shroud. The area in which they settled was an open plain interspersed with massive outcrops of light-colored rock, distinctly bereft of the thick forest cover now associated with the region. The abundance of stone allowed the Hur to erect exceptionally sturdy structures, and by the year 300, central Aldenard had transformed into the bustling city of Amdapur. The people of Amdapur attempted to commune with the enigmatic elementals of the Black Shroud, that they might partake in the bounty of the forest. The elementals, ever untrusting of men, declined any interaction with their new neighbors, content with the distance between them. The Amdapuri respected this wish, and did not forcibly encroach upon the sacred holt, save for the occasional pursuit of quarry during a hunt. It is worth mentioning, however, that the elementals did not entirely shun outsiders during this period. Amicable relations were maintained with the Ixali tribes, the elementals allowing them ingress into the Shroud upon deeming the beastmen no threat to the forest's natural balance.
As their city-state prospered, the Amdapori focused on fortifying their domain, expanding their defenses by constructing an enormous stronghold atop a knoll outside the city proper. Paying reverence to Nofika, the goddess of abundance, they claimed to cherish harmony with nature and promised their neighbors a peaceful coexistence. The societies in the surrounding vicinity benefited from this philosophy, and Amdapur was viewed not as a threat, but a respected elder watching over its eleven fellow cities. Thus did it come to be known as the Ancient City. Much of what remains of the city of Amdapur is slowly being swallowed by an ever-thickening blanket of mold and rot caused by an elemental imbalance lingering in the aftermath of the Seventh Umbral Calamity. Even so, archaeologists expect the decay will do little to destroy the ancient city's stone foundations, architectural feats which have already withstood more than a millennium and a half of nature's wrath. The Discovery of White Magic The Amdapori initially harnessed basic magics for use in their city's defenses, drawing and expanding upon the primitive knowledge of golem creation to temporarily imbue stone statues with life. However, in the ninth century, mages of the ancient city bore witness to Mark's use of the destructive arts to subjugate neighboring city-states. Wary of their neighbors' ambitions, the Amdapori sought to counter these black magics by improving upon their own spellcraft, weaving with the intent to purify, ward, and heal the art of white magic. It has been argued that without the discovery of white magic, Amdapur would likely have succumbed to Mark's ambitions. That the ancient city had developed a means to keep the black mages in check prevented the Maki army from waging a full-fledged assault on Amdapur, lest they too suffer grievous losses. Thus, for the next few centuries did Eorzea experience a fragile, yet lasting peace fostered by the precarious balance between the two nations and their opposing schools of magic. Despite their sinister visage, demon walls are not void scent, but forge kin created using a primal form of Amdapori white magic. By inscribing a stone wall with an arcane pattern of blood, these golems would spring to life to intimidate and repel trespassers. Carved during the Fifth Astral Era, the Winged Lion is an ensorcelled stone guardian capable of manipulating white magic at its own will, a testament to the advancement of Amdapur's arcane capabilities. War on the Horizon The peoples of Eorzea flourished in the peace brought about by the impasse between the black and white schools of sorcery. Following in the footsteps of Mark and Amdabor, other city-states began developing their own forms of spellcraft in attempts to further their societies. This approach to the achievement of prosperity was vastly different than that taken by the Allegans of the Third Astral Era, eschewing technological growth for advancement of a more arcane nature. However, progress would come with a hefty price, as man would soon become drunk on the might that arcane puissance would bring him. Societies built upon foundations of magic were forced to sacrifice their natural surroundings as vast amounts of ether were drawn from the land in order to maintain the city's magnificence. The realm's enlightenment had become a double-edged sword. Each mage city maintained the façade of an edifying heritage while secretly honing their offensive magics. One need not be an oracle to see that this interlude of peace would soon draw to an end. The mages of Mark silently turned their eyes to the dark, seeking to slake their expansionist ambitions by amassing an army of void-sent thralls. Amdapur kept their outward appearance as a rich bastion of arts and culture, but daunting sculptures of its guardians soon appeared in every corner of the city. While the actual catalyst for war remains lost to time, it is known that the frequency of political and military posturing between the two nations increased in dramatic fashion as the realm approached the mid-13th century, and ere long, the entirety of Eorzea became entangled in an inescapable web of strife. 
the War of the Magi had begun. The Floating City of Nim Near the 500th year of the 5th Astral Era, scores of Lalafelon sailors arrived on Vilbrin's shores in longboats woven of reeds. Here, the mercantilists built a meager settlement on the southern part of the isle, with hopes of establishing trade with the native kobold tribes. In time, their lonely outpost would grow into the maritime city of Nim. Nim's population was not as robust as the other twelve city-states, but what the Nimians lacked in ascendancy they made up for in commerce, making full use of their consummate skills in seafaring. Nim's sailors were a rough and rowdy lot, traits they used to their advantage in establishing the Royal Marines, a small yet fearsome naval force that was placed in charge of the city's defenses. Translations of Nimian records depict the marines as axe-wielding marauders who would fight alongside a handful of talented mages who provided healing and support by way of their own uniquely developed brand of spellcraft. Despite their humble ranks, the marines' tact proved their greatest strength. A great portion of Nim's legacy alluding to legends of their fierce martial prowess. Even during the Great War, the Royal Marines ensured that their small nation maintained its independence by valiantly repelling wave after wave of void scent sent by the Maki across the Rothlet Sound. The Wanderer's Palace was a massive stone temple dedicated to the Nimian's patron god, Oshon, ruler of the mountains and protector of vagrants. It appears to be coincidence that Vilbrin's indigenous kobold tribes also worshipped the mountains, revering Mount Ogamoro as their sacred mother. But this commonality is believed to be why the Nimians were able to foster amicable relations with the Beastmen. The Nimian Plague The War of the Magi raged for nigh on three centuries before Nim was stricken by a mysterious plague severely crippling the city-state. One common theory used to explain how the scourge was spread involves a curious story concerning a band of Nimian sailors who had been cast adrift in the South Seas after their ship was battered by a fearsome storm. The disoriented seamen landed on a desert isle where they met a native tribe of Lalafels who nursed them back to health and mended their broken vessel so they might return safely to Nim. Before the traders disembarked, the islanders bestowed upon them a parting gift, an ornate amphora. Not long after the sailors returned to the floating city and presented the token of friendship, Nim's people fell one by one to an incurable sickness heretofore unseen on Vilbrand. It was not until it was too late that Nimian scholars discovered the amphora to be part of an elaborate maki plan, that would see the unleashing of Bitoso, a pestilence-carrying void scent summoned to Eorzea for the sole purpose of decimating the Nimian population. Those who contracted the void scent's disease experienced disfiguring symptoms. Their nose and ears melted away, their limbs shriveled, and their flesh turned a ghastly shade of green. Attempts to contain the plague included isolation of the infected who were locked away within the Wanderer's Palace, the sacred Nimian Temple of Oshon. The Nimians remained wholly unaware of Bitoso's cloaked presence, and even as the temple's halls became filled with the sick and dying, the plague continued to spread. Panic over the Green Death eventually drove the city-state's mages to their wit's end, leaving them with no choice but to take drastic measures. In a last fit of desperation, the mages used their magics to swell the land's waters, sealing the Wanderer's Palace as well as the fates of those trapped inside. Hysteria surrounding the plague would eventually consume the Nimians, leading their nation down the path of self-destruction. The Maki were ready to reap the seeds of destruction they had sown. Many of those afflicted with the Nimian plague were roused from a deep slumber when the protective barrier that for centuries had isolated the Wanderer's palace from the outside world was shattered by the fallen shards of Dalamud. 
With no knowledge of the plague and its disfiguring effects on the skin and extremities, those early explorers of the recently surfaced temple claimed the ruins to be inhabited by tonberries, mythical, rancorous creatures believed to stalk the shadows of night in search of revenge. Bitoso's ability to conceal his form left the Nimians guessing as to the actual cause of the plague that was consuming their city from within. By the time they had uncovered the truth, it was too late to save those who had fallen, both to the scourge itself and at the hands of the mages who had sought to quell it. The Battle of Amdapur By the year 1510, the War of the Magi was nearing a climax as the Void Mages of Mach pushed ever closer to Amdapur. Despite having stood for centuries, Amdapur Keep, the ancient city's first line of defense, was quick to fall to Mach's fell army of otherworldly demons. With the gate to Amdapur lane open, the Void Mages heralded their arrival in the city proper with the summoning of Diablos, a high-ranking Void Scent meant to seal Amdapur's fate. However, Mark sorely underestimated the defensive magics of Amdapur. To withstand Diablos and the minions under his unholy command, the White Mages breathed life into the city's most powerful stone guardians, gathering their collective strength the Amdapori were able to seal away the Void Prince, forcing the Maki to withdraw. Yet, while the ancient city may have triumphed that day, it was a hollow victory, for it did little to stall the sun as it set on this once great civilization. The era's darkest hour was nigh. The Maki march on Amdapur was not the sole cause of Eorzea's downfall, Three centuries of ceaseless assault on the land had taken its toll. The drain of energies used to propagate war, sending the realm's elemental balance askew. This final battle was merely the straw which saw the balance break. Only after the dust settled did the people of Eorzea begin to truly notice the damage they had wrought. The realm's most powerful seers were called to scry the realm's future, but what they foresaw was darkness. It was too late to amend their ways. A calamity was upon them, and soon the waters would rise to purge the land of those who had ravaged her so. Crafted and given life by the mages of Amdapur, Karibu is one of many guardian statues erected around the city to counter the void sent invasion. Using advanced techniques honed over centuries, the Amdapuri were able to create a golem who had not only mastered martial artistry, but arcane spellcasting as well. The Maki had intended Diablos to be their secret weapon in annihilating the Amdapuri mages and toppling the ancient city. What they had underestimated was the desperation with which the white mages would fight to defend their home and the home of their children. Though many gave their lives in the task, Diablos was eventually sealed deep beneath the city, and Amdapur was safe for a time. Birth of the Grand Companies Scholars and mages from all nations entreated their governments to, if not temporarily, set aside their differences and focus their attentions on the larger problem at hand. Monitoring of the realm's aether indicated an unhealthy imbalance toward water, suggesting the manifestation of a calamity-scale flood of epic proportions. The city-state's leaders could not long deny the evidence laid before them, and though begrudgingly at first, soon began to pool their resources, hastily creating central command centers to first and foremost address the protection of civilians from the coming deluge. These emergency forces would later become known as the Grand Companies. The Nimians, despite still reeling from the losses incurred by the plague, ordered their dwindled military forces out into the rising seas to construct an expansive floating net of protective wards dubbed Operation Maelstrom. 
Amdapur mobilized what remained of its military to commence the evacuation of the realm's people north to the mountains of Abalathia's spine, abandoning the city so many had recently given their lives to defend. The Ark of the Maki As the grand companies of Mark and Amdapur enacted their contingency plans to evacuate their citizenry to higher ground, the Maki were looking beyond the mountains. Well beyond. Confident in their ability to control any and all monstrosities wrested from the void, the city-state began construction of an airship known as the Ark, designed to run on the dark energies of an entire legion of void scent sealed within its hull. The rulers of Mak envisioned that the floating sanctuary would carry entire families and their livelihoods, livestock, seeds, supplies, into the skies where they would wait in relative safety until the waters of the Calamity had receded. Yet even with a myriad of mindless thralls at their disposal, the Ark still required a core powerful enough to see the vessel to the heavens. Thus, the Void Mages sought the power of a Void Scent, the likes of which they had never before summoned. A ruler from one of the highest tiers of the Voidal Hierarchy, Skahak, the Shadow Queen. Only a mage of strong mind could endeavor to control so potent a prisoner without the use of the Nullstone, which, by this time, had been lost to the rising waters. The responsibility was ultimately given to Cesare Blackwind, a high void mage of questionable repute and outspoken critic of the War of the Magi. Upon learning of the Ark and the means by which the Maki mages sought to power the vessel, Cesare voiced her vehement disapproval of the plan, claiming it reckless at best, deadly at worst. However, the rising seas that had already begun to swallow the realm left her little choice, and she reluctantly agreed to helm the plan, if only to save the lives of her people. Cesare and her cadre of fifty and three void mages boarded the Ark, and successfully contained within a complex network of interconnected coffins the energies of Skahak and more than fifty score void scent. The vessel launched to the cheers of an entire nation, the hopes that their efforts would lead to the preservation of their society. The Ark and her passengers, however, were never to return. Despite the peerless talent of Cesare and her cadre, the overwhelming power of the Shadow Queen could not long be contained. The mage's grip on Skahak slowly loosened, and the lesser creatures under the Queen's command escaped their fetters. Free to roam the ship, the Void Scent took full advantage of the tight quarters to make quick work of the Maki citizenry. Fearing that a complete loss of control was inevitable, the High Void Mage and her loyal compeers chose to sacrifice their lives in one final attempt to redouble the seal on Skahak and return her minions to their coffins. With no surviving Void Mages, the familiar Ket Shi was left alone aboard the masterless vessel as it wandered through the mists of the Sea of Clouds, where it has since been given a more ominous title, the Void Ark. Advancements in airship technology achieved in the late 6th and early 7th astral eras have given rise to increased numbers of expeditions into skies unknown. Reports from the expeditions of sightings of a massive ghost ship drifting aimlessly in the sea of clouds gave rise to official investigations which, in turn, resulted in the rediscovery of Mark's forsaken ark, lost some thousand and five hundred years past. Deep within the Void Ark's hull are stowed seemingly endless rows of stone coffins. These sarcophagi were not, however, funerary vessels used to inter the remains of the vessel's passengers, but containment units for void scent summoned by the Ark's architects. The coffins served as arcane foci to channel the dark energies of the creatures trapped within and divert them to the Ark's engines. One such coffin is a massive stone cyst believed to once contain Skahak, the Shadow Queen. A powerful void scent, Skahak was summoned along with a thousand-strong army of lesser minions to serve as the Ark's means of propulsion. 
The Void Mage's efforts to control the Queen and her servants, however, were met with disastrous results. The Sixth Umbral Era The Calamity of Water As both scholar and seer scried, the realm's elemental imbalance culminated in a far-reaching flood that eventually swept over Eorzea, and with the calamity of water did the Fifth Astral Era come to a close. Coastal towns were pummeled by tidal waves while rivers overflowed their banks, swallowing settlements and leaving inerable soils in their wake. The great city of Mark was swallowed whole by a torrent the likes of which the realm had heretofore never experienced. The few who remained drowned as they cast their eyes and hopes heavensward, content in the belief that the Ark would see the glory of their people endure. Those who had the sense to retreat to higher ground would return to your fame to learn they were the inheritors to a wasteland of salt-clogged swamps where even the hardiest of weeds refused to take root, let alone crops with which one might sustain a family. The few remaining Nimian citizens who had not been touched by the Green Death evacuated north into the mountainous regions of Outer Lenosia as the Royal Marines commenced their ambitious Operation Maelstrom. While the Grand Company was successful in turning back the largest of swells, the mages were unable to prevent the scores of subsequent waves from pulverizing their coastal city-state. Lands reclaimed by the sea were reduced to rocky reefs, leaving nary an ulm to which Nim's few survivors might return. As most of their land's energies had been exhausted in their efforts to seal Diablos, there was little remaining for Amdabor's white mages to draw upon to stay the waters, which had already enveloped the territories held by Nim and Mark. The alternative was a hurried exodus into the highlands of Girabanya before the deluge reached the ancient city. The region abandoned, the elementals, who had quietly borne witness to the Amdapori people's rapacious consumption of the land's ether, saw to it that the city remnants be devoured in thick, sorcerous brush not long after the waters receded, thereafter preventing ingress into Amdapur. Thus did the ruins remain hidden from mortal eyes until the elementals' glamours were dispelled during the Seventh Calamity. It could be said that the greatest of Eorzea's magical civilizations succumbed to a chaos of their own contriving, yet it would be misguided to conclude that the entirety of mankind was beyond redemption for the sins of a few. Amidst the strife of the Calamity and the subsequent Sixth Umbral Era, legends have long told of the advent of a band of saviors known as the Twelve Archons, who helped to warn the people of impending doom and provide salvation to countless scores in their time of need. Without champions such as these, the path to the Sixth Astral Era may have been longer and more fraught with peril than it actually was. Next chapter, The Sixth Astral Era, Prosperity and Progress.